Good morning, Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, back with you on this little rainy but still delightful Monday morning. Mm -hmm. I'm here in the studio with Dr. Dana Hawkinson. Dana, again, Hawkeye, and the Medical Director for Infection Prevention and Control here. And Dr. Mario Castro, our Division Director for Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. He's got a bunch of other titles. He's here, head of our <laughs> Clinical Translational Research Unit here at KU. And in Studio B, Lance Williamson, who's an IPAC supervisor and incoming president of the Greater Kansas City Chapter of the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. That's a lot of words, Lance. <laughs> Congratulations on that. And on the phone is John Rules, a KDHE epidemiologist, and Lee Norman's right-hand person. So we've got a great crowd here to, today to help us talk more about where we are with infection prevention and control and where we are in epidemiology and where we're going to go with vaccinations. We're going to get into those topics. Yeah. But first, Dana, yeah. let me know, brother, what we got. Yeah, I think we're doing okay. We want to do better. That's better uh, than last Monday when you said, not good. It wasn't not good. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't seen the increase that we saw from last week. Um, that I think on Monday we had like 36, 35. We have 33 patients today in the hospital. It's been flat, really. It's, yeah, we're just kind of hanging right there. Which I is like good. that. That's better than what... Right. Yes, it's better than, yeah, than yeah, we don't like the up curve. We like um, the flat curve. So 11 of those are in the ICU, uh, four on the vent. So, but I think we are somewhat happy. Um, we, we had wish a few it were deaths. Low. We had a few deaths because we, we had not had a death since June 27th. But over the weekend, I think we, we had, had a couple a few, of right? yeah. two or three, and yeah. And so I think those patients I, again, we don't know the details, but we're in the hospital for quite some time. So that puts us at 30 deaths so far. I mm -hmm. think is that about right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lance, in your world, how are things going out there in infection prevention and control? Uh, it's, it's good. Um, we recently had our APIC uh, Kansas City chapter meeting, and we were able to have a really good conversation with Dr. Norman, um, and so that was great to, to hear from him. And um, on the, the hospital side, we're, we're doing well. You know, Dr. Norman kind of talked about this battle rhythm that we have now, um, really, that this is kind of a, we're, we're in that battle rhythm now. And so it's it's every day, you know, we're working very hard, and, and I think we, we kind of understand now that this is... Um, not going away, and this is something that you know we're going to have to continue to work for um, to d to do better and protect the health of our community as we go. So that's kind of what we're focused on now is just how do we sustain and and be able to continue to fight this when you know we're all feeling like um, this has been a long time, and especially the uh, public health experts out there. You know, this has been since March that we've been every day doing this battle rhythm. So I think that's what we're focused on now is kind of how do we keep going at this point. And there's a, there's a lot of rhythm out there. So, John, yeah, talk yeah. to us a little bit about how are things from a KDHE standpoint? How do you see Kansas doing? Um, the good news is, just like your hospital seems to be flattening, it seems like our cases are flattening and or decreasing slightly. You know, the problem with trying to look at case and or hospitalizations is we're always kind of following behind about a five to seven day delay um, because what we try to look at is symptom onset date and not necessarily report date because report date is conflated by, you know, maybe a lab batched a lot of things or maybe a health system didn't report until after a weekend. So you might see a Monday or Tuesday spike in cases reported, but that's not necessarily when someone gets sick. So from, from the epidemiology perspective, we're always trying to look at that epi curve with symptom onset date. And as I said, you know, if you look back about 10 days ago to seven days ago, it looks like we're topping and decreasing. And, and the other good news is it seems like as a percent of cases, um, death rate or death percentage seems to have leveled off at less than about 1% consistently and we were up at like seven to eight percent at the worst of it back in april so those two metrics are really good um from kdhc you know he's talking about uh, lance was talking about a battle rhythm um our battle rhythm is constant and all the time even on the weekends we kind of started back in january when we realized that something was coming and we actually stood up our incident command in late January, early February. And here the leadership team has regular um, group meetings either between our own KDG staff and other organizations. And as, and, and as an example of other organizations, I actually am not an employee of KDHC. I am actually a Kansas National Guard person activated to 
help Dr. Norman full time because of my background. Um, I've been working with them since February um, full time this entire time, and I'm probably going to do so for the next year. So this is truly a whole agency inner collaboration between about everybody that you can think of. Yeah, pandemics are like that. They make us all strange bedfellows, right? Because we're, <laughs> we're in different things together. So, John, Kansas has bent the curve, it sounds like, again. Why, what, what's happened to change that? We are going up. How do we bend it? I, I'm, I hope, I, I hope, I believe that maybe the governor's um, – emergency order on the face masks, even though it was left up to individual counties and jurisdictions to adopt that. Um, we have seen quite a few places, especially our larger jurisdictions, adopt the face mask. And I think, you know, if, if you start looking at the meta-analysis of all the published literature, there seems to be an ongoing increasing amount of evidence real evidence for face mask use preventing coronavirus. I listened to your guys' um, podcast last Friday, and I so saw that you guys mentioned it maybe 13 times, which maybe we need to do it 30 times this time. But it is that social distancing, those pillars of prevention, that's really important, that face mask use, really important. So, John, did you get to see our really cool shot in the freezer? That's the real question. Did you, if you saw the thing I, last I, that's, that's, Yeah, my... my my undergrad is in engineering, and uh, what you guys did on Friday with the with the freezer that was quite excellent. And I know a lot of people over the weekend. I saw comments of We're people saying you needed to cut out just that and put that up on your site. And do some more work in the freezer too. Our freezer career is not done yet, even though it's it, getting off. It's <laughs> just getting off. That's <laughs> right. Off. All right, Mario. You're out in the front lines of this from a research perspective. What do we see coming down the road? What can you help us know this, that, that's going to be in our future? Well, I, I think the, the big advance that we're looking forward is vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. These are really going to be our forefront to really change this epidemic, this pandemic. I, I want those. I don't want to be back in the freezer again, <laughs> especially for all the wrong reasons. So you got to help us get there, right? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's been so much thrown at coronavirus in terms of treatment and prevention. And, and uh, we ultimately know that the best strategy for this virus is, is a vaccine and potentially monoclonal antibodies. Mm -hmm. So there are five vaccines that are being supported by the NIH um, through a network. Um, there are many more mm -hmm. out there that are being developed around the world. But these five are really going to undergo rigorous clinical trials. They're going to be, um, they're on Operation Warp Speed. Uh, mm -hmm. They're on this I love fast that. track. Yeah. As, a, as a Trekkie, that, that's music for the ears. <laughs> but, uh, but they're still being done by the top centers around the country. They're being done in a careful, systematic way. Uh, to help us get the right answer and to do it right uh, for our patients. Um, the one we're going to launch here in Kansas City and across uh, the state of Kansas and even into Missouri uh, is the one that was developed by Oxford University. And um, this vaccine is very exciting. The preliminary results were just released about a week ago now in Lancet. Mm -hmm. and. That study showed us in over a thousand individuals that were given this vaccine um, that it simulated antibodies like we want to see them, just as good as convalescent plasma, and it was boosted by a second injection. Um, so that information was was very. Um, I was excited. I was excited. Yeah, it was excited. <laughs> I was, I was pretty excited. Oh, and, this is goodness. And, and then not only on top of that, um, the safety was there. Um, the vaccine stimulated reactions around the injection site, some discomfort, caused some low-grade symptoms like you typically see after a flu shot. Yeah, bring it uh, on, bring it on. Yeah, just some headaches, muscle aches, low-grade fever, myalgias, you know, uh, malaise type of thing. Nothing unexpected. And in fact, in over a thousand patients, there was no serious adverse event reported, which is very heartening, I think. When we look along clinical trials, things happen, you know, and we did not see that in this preliminary data. So now we need to do the big study. Mm -hmm. And so we are getting ready to launch this study mid-August. Our hope is to launch it here approximately August 10th, so in about two weeks. And 
we're going to try to enroll across the U.S. 30,000 participants uh, into this uh, vaccine trial. The vaccine was purchased by AstraZeneca, so now it's identified by the AZ uh, company. And this vaccine will be given in two injections. So you come in, uh, you get, um, if you qualify, then you get your first shot and then you come back four weeks later and you get your second shot. Mm -hmm. And so then do you go maskless after that to see if you, <laughs> what happens? How do you determine? Well, it's going to be uh, rigorously done. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to measure antibodies uh, 15 days after the each injection. So we're going to measure it after the first injection and after the second injection. And we think that, you know, if everything's going right, that uh, we're going to uh, determine um, by two weeks after that second injection that you will be protected. Um, the problem, Steve, is this is still a clinical trial. It is a clinical trial. And yeah. so um, in order to do a rigorous clinical trial, you have to have a placebo group. So if you participate in our study, you won't know if you got the real thing or mm -hmm. if you got placebo. Yeah. So you're going to have to still follow everything, the mask and everything. Um, even after you get participate in our study. The good thing is uh, the way we set up the randomization is for every three people that get the shot, uh, one of the three get placebo, two of the three get the active vaccine. And so w we think that's great. I mean, that increases your odds of getting the real mm -hmm. thing. Um, and also we wanna mention to everybody that, um, that does get the placebo, after we determine if this vaccine works or not, you're eligible to come back and get the real stuff, the real vaccine. So we, this is really uh, going to take everybody in the public to really take this on. And I know there are some vaccine hesitant individuals, mm -hmm. um, but this is going to really require our public, our volunteers, our community to help us participate in this study so we can figure out a solution to this. So how do people sign up for that study if they want to be a part of that, Lance? So we're going to, I think, put in the header here um, a couple uh, pieces of contact information. Uh, first, um, there is a website called coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org. Okay. Pretty long <laughs> coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org. And if you go through that website, uh, there's a registry there that's anonymous. And, but you have to identify your site as KUMC, those four initials, KUMC. Once you register online at coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org, then we get that information and then we can contact you. The other way is just to pick up the phone and give us a call. Here in Kansas City region, uh, uh, contact Shelby at 913-574-3006. That's 574-3006. We're also excited that we're gonna launch this not just here in Kansas City, but throughout the region. And so we're partnering with our colleagues at, at KU Wichita mm -hmm. to launch this as well. Uh, Dr. Tiffany Schwarzenegger is, is going um, to launch it with us there. And the number there is 316-293-1833, 316-293-1833. Contacting us will allow you uh, then to schedule an appointment, hopefully starting here mid-August, mm -hmm. and get you started uh, in our vaccine study. Um, and we're up front. You know, this, we are trying to enroll individuals that are adults, 18, age, 18 years or older. Um, we're trying to aim for about one-fourth of the 30,000 to be over 65. And... Um, you have to be at risk of getting COVID-19. Um, if you're not out in the public, you're staying at home, probably not a very high risk of you coming into the study. <laughs> not very good chance. Can the entire could... University of Kansas get in rural, rural than Lawrence? Because we think <laughs> yeah. I think if you're working with COVID-19, I think you're pretty eligible uh, yeah. and at risk. Um, so we are definitely enrolling uh, healthcare workers. Um, but importantly, we want to enroll at risk populations. So we went and roll. I know Dana's talked about, you know, how the statistics are just starkly um, crazy high incidence, high morbidity mm -hmm. in our African-American patients and our Hispanic patients. And uh, 
as a Latino myself, you know, I really want something to help us protect our, our people. Uh, and this is going to be, I think, an opportunity for that. And I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, people understand we're doing this in the safest, expeditious, but scientific way possible. And that if you have some hesitancy about the vaccine, we hope that we can talk to you, see those, you know, hear those fears out, um, and make sure you're informed about the study uh, and you make an informed decision. It is important that, you know, you understand you're not going to get the real thing every time. Two out of three individuals will get the real vaccine and will need to follow you afterwards. The study wants to follow you up to two years. That's a long time, a long time. <laughs> to be in a study. But we don't know how long this vaccine is going to work. Right. You know, is it going to work a year? Is it going to work two years? You know, are we going to have to revaccinate? These are all questions that our mm -hmm. infectious disease colleagues are, are really trying to answer quickly. Uh, but doing a study like this is the only way possible. And Mario, as you look at that, I know the government has been buying vaccine already, mm -hmm. pre-purchasing. It's going into production. This is one of them. Is that a sign, do you think, of uh, it's going to work or, or give, me, give me your thoughts about that. I don't think the government goes around pre-purchasing drugs too often. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm very excited by um, the preliminary work that really was done to lead to this level. Um, the very first studies uh, immunized um, uh, Reese's uh, monkeys and after they immunized, they were exposed to the virus and it protected them. They, we actually measured the virus inside the lungs of those mm -hmm. monkeys, and it protected mm -hmm. them. That is pretty striking yeah. scientific evidence. Well, um, I, can, and I that, feel like that's warp one, warp two, right there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of a Trekkie. It's kind of Captain <laughs> Kirk or uh, Jean-Luc speak. So. so, you know, I do believe this, is, this vaccine is going to work. I do believe it's going to change our pandemic. It's going to change this curve. Um, and it's the only thing that's going to let us get back to normalcy. And the question that's on most minds here in Kansas City is how soon can, really, can Patrick Mahomes and Travis yeah. Kelsey, Tyron Matthew, and now, just to say, Brady Singer, <laughs> did you watch him pitch people Friday night? Because that was lights out. How, how soon do you think they'll be able to get that vaccine? Well, uh, this next week, uh, one of the vaccines is launching, Moderna uh, is launching their vaccine. Here in Kansas City, we'll be launching in about two weeks. So that's pretty soon. Yeah. The baseball season won't be over yet. And I said Friday <laughs> night, Singer uh, debuted Saturday. So awesome. <laughs> I, I do have my things going there. All right. Well, I bet there may, there may be some questions out there from media. Uh, Jill, what are we hearing this morning from our, from our media colleagues? Nothing. So right, Kathy has be. a... Kathy has a question. Yeah. Is the vaccine a live virus vaccine? Live or killed? Great. This is a, a great question. Um, so the way this vaccine was developed, it was put inside a chimpanzee adenovirus vector. Uh, so it's DNA, basically. And it's inside that, um, I call it like a, take this, everybody's seen the picture around the vir of the virus. It's got all those little spikes on top of it. Just imagining taking those spikes off and putting them inside of a box and then using that as a, as a vector to give you the vaccine. And so this vaccine is not a live vaccine. It is um, attenuated so it doesn't replicate. It doesn't, you know, it's just carrying the vaccine, the protein from coronavirus into your body to stimulate that immune system of yours to protect you. Um, and those antibodies are, you know, we're going to be measuring them as part of the study. Do you have developed serologic antibody within uh, two weeks after the vaccine um, and what we call neutralizing antibody uh, as well? What was interesting from that preliminary study that came out last week was um, if you got the second vaccine, 100 percent of those individuals had neutralizing antibodies, which is ultimately what yeah. you need from a vaccine. Uh, that sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah. yeah. That sounds real good. <laughs> uh, all right. But so, we got to do it in 30,000. You know, this is a smaller yeah, study. You a, got, we got to do it definitively, and, and we need everybody's help to participate. Lance, that's got to be music to your ears if you think about infection prevention and control. Man, this is like the best possibility, right? 
Yeah, that's um, really exciting for us. Um, you know, I think we are right now in the weeds of this short game here where it's we are trying to do everything we can for the public to, um, you know, do the practices that we know can help. Distancing, the masking, you know, two and a half months ago, we alluded to this earlier, two and a half months ago, we really had no scientific data on universal masking and it, does it actually help? And uh, now we do, we know that countries and states that have adopted this practice uh, sooner than later have had better outcomes. And I think, Everyone, this is on everyone's mind. Every time I talk to my family, like my grandma, she just wants to get back to the casino. And, you know, we are all grieving the loss of our life um, that we knew before coronavirus happened. And I think everyone is really focusing on this. So me and my team, this is this is our effort to, to get back to that and everyone um, at the health system as well. So yeah, my family, um, my coworkers, we all miss our life before COVID. And, and of course, this is our job to respond to things like this, but we absolutely want to get there and, and have a, you know, um, a society where we can kind of get back to normal and, and be more um, um, safe and, and hopefully have an immunity. And then also treatment for, for COVID as well. I think that antiviral treatments, whatever we can do to um, get that a little more um, helpful for people is going to make this more manageable as we go forward. Yeah. And John, the thought of a vaccine, I'm sure that KDHE has spent some time thinking about that and thinking forward. What are your, what are your, what's your sense about how you would even prioritize something like that? So we, we have been totally leaning forward and hoping that something comes out sooner rather than later. Um, the state itself hasn't been making any future purchases of um, specific vaccines yet. I know the federal side has, but what the state has been doing is purchasing materials to get ready um, for a mass vaccination. So as an example, you know, three million of whatever we need to actually roll out a vaccine over the next year. So things like needles and any other things to help support that initiative. Um, in terms of prioritization schemes, if you go back 10 years ago to H1N1, there was a pretty well-established, you know, high-risk population schemes that we're, we'll be following something very similar um, since, you know, in the initial rollout, even if we had all the vaccine available to us, say, like September, October, which I'm not ex expecting that, but just as an example, say we had 3 million doses, there would be no way to actually dispense that in, in a matter of weeks, that would take uh, that would be a huge effort to be able to get all of that dispensed. And so, even even with unlimited vaccine, it would be difficult. So you'd have to prioritize. But we're anticipating limited supplies, and you know the the numbers in the 30s or 40,000 numbers. Um, so you'll definitely have to look at the higher risk populations, like nursing homes, as an example. Yeah, you bet. And you know. Chief Super Bowl, John, don't forget about that. Yeah, another one. Jill? Of course. Of course. Yeah. Got questions pouring in. They're really good ones, too. Uh, Imbalia asks, do you have to quarantine if you receive the vaccine? No. So there's no replication of, of, of the virus. So there's no need to quarantine after you receive the, the vaccine. So that would be great news. When do you think, assuming we're at warp eight, We'll call Scotty to help us get that study, get the enterprise going here. But <laughs> what, 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 if it's a we're at Warp Eight, what, what's the earliest you think a vaccine would be available? I suspect early next year. Okay. Um, what we're going to need to do is we're hoping to enroll over 1,250 participants here at KU um, over 60 days. Mm -hmm. That is warp speed for yes, us. It is. <laughs> yes, it is. And so, uh, if you can imagine, then that time frame, that's going to be starting here in August, mid-August, September, October. And then we're going to have to follow all those for at least another uh, 60 days to see what their antibody response is. Then that information we have to analyze. So, you know, we're looking into the beginning of next year. Yeah. Um, and the Moderna vaccine is only about a week ahead or two weeks ahead. So we're all going to be pushing, I think, to get these early results to know if the vaccine is going to be safe and efficacious. Um, yeah. So I, I don't expect this to be uh, available yet, September, October. I, I do want to mention to John, we are uh, fortunate we're going to have two mobile vans. And so we want to travel Kansas. We want to travel uh, to our regions. We want to travel to the community centers. We want to travel to the nursing homes, the extended care facilities. 
and we want to enroll the highest risk yeah. in the individuals yeah. there. Um, so these are going to be fully stocked mobile vans. You can drive one, Steve. I'm want. ready. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to volunteer for the trial. <laughs> Each one of these vans has three exam rooms on it, full uh, uh, nurse practitioner. They provide us a driver, so I don't need Yeah, to hey, I was going to say, I could put, put, put my Enterprise, uh, I got my you know, Captain Kirk outfit, so our Spock outfit, really. <laughs> All right, Jill, next question. For Barbara, can Spock. someone from St. Joseph up on the Missouri side who is at high risk be in the study? People are wanting to know, is it just for Kansans? Yeah. Sure, great question. Um, so we're envisioning um, to enroll within a 100-mile radius. So certainly St. Joe would be in, in that radius. Um, there are nine visits, but a couple of the visits are by phone. Uh, so there is some travel that's going to be involved if you're coming from St. Joe uh, to our center. Um, we're not sure at this point if we'd take our van up there to, to St. Joe, but if we can get a, a big group out there, that would be certainly a possibility. But most than likely, it would mean traveling down here a few times. Sue wants to know, will the vaccine protect individuals from spreading to others? Oh, How does that look, Mario? Anything? Yeah, so... Um, we're going to be actually measuring viral shedding uh, after you get the vaccine. So we'll get some information yeah. about that. Um, exactly if the question is, the vaccine is not going to prevent you from being exposed. You're still going to have to be very careful, washing hands, coughing, sneezing into your, um, to your arm, not in, out on the, and when you have to wear your mask. Um, <clears throat> but the vaccine will protect you from getting sick you know, if it works, it protects you from getting sick, from getting the pneumonia. And so the spread, though, can still occur um, just from individuals that are not vaccinated. And certainly that continue, can, will continue to be a problem. I think uh, Dr. Fauci mentioned that really we need to get to around 75% of the population vaccinated. And if we are able to achieve that goal, then we'll start to achieve herd immunity. And, and maybe yeah. Dana, Dana, you could comment on that. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good number. You know, typically we think of herd immunity as, again, 80 to 90% or more. Um, some people have even said now 50. I think 75 is a good um, number to think about for herd immunity mm -hmm. and uh, from vaccination. So I think that would be very good. So it's pretty exciting. I mean, as an infectious disease yeah. doctor, to see something like this develop so fast, that, that is warp speed. It I mean, is you, warp you've speed. You've got to be pretty excited about that because there's been nothing like that before. No. Nope. Uh, again, the, I think the quickest vaccine that has come to market is um, four years from start to finish. Um, we know, again, polio, I think, was 50 years from when they discovered the virus to when they have a vaccine. So this is moving extremely quickly. And we need to also... Um, you know, talk about influenza vaccine too. So it's mm -hmm. going to be important to get both of those. Influenza season is coming up. Getting influenza vaccine is going to be vitally important. We don't know what the outcomes will be if you have both viruses, if you have both infections. So, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully we can get this vaccine, um, which again has shown to be very safe now. And it is not the full virus. It's only that piece, that spike piece that you see and talk about. So that should be very safe. Um, hopefully we can get that rolled out within early next year um, and then we will again start to get back to what we can do try to get mass populations vaccinated and try to achieve that herd immunity John when you look at that the concept of this herd immunity what is it from an epidemiologist standpoint you think we need to achieve it, it, I I think some of those similar numbers you know back in grad school that 70 percent level seemed to be the bare minimum Minimum. I don't know where some people are getting 50%. I, you know, you look at Monte Carlo simulation modeling. Basically, you look at a node analysis of who interacts with who, and in in our population, we interact together. That mixing variable is so high. Um, which is why we look at clusters, right? That's that's why we are trying to keep sporting events. You know, you keep mentioning the Royals and Chiefs. The reason why we don't want people to be there is you'd have so many people on top of each other. So, in in, in our society, um, that seventy to seventy five percent, I think, is the absolute bare minimum. But again, that's contingent on how much people interact together. And I, I love the Star Trek references. Um, I myself is a science officer, so I literally am a Dr. Spock for the military. 
awesome. <laughs> I love it. Do you have a blue? Do you have a blue kind of? I have one of those blue thing like spot for. I never wear a I red one a, because you don't survive. But the blue ones and the gold ones, those are okay. Kim so. wants to know. This is a really interesting question. If we were to get this vaccine and then another vaccine mm -hmm. comes out later and it is deemed to be the vaccine, yeah. the better one. What do you do? Yeah, Can you get one. both? Does this prevent us from getting a different one for COVID? Is it possible that you could have more than one of these companies have a successful yeah. vaccine? We hope so. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. ultimately, that is the goal to have. You know. We don't have one antibiotic. We have many antibiotics, and so it's it's good for us as um, a health uh, public health to have multiple choices uh, for our patients. Um, we are, you know, we are not studying everybody. We're not studying kids. We're not studying people that are immunosuppressed, um, and so there are going to need to be other vaccines that may work better. Uh, or safer uh, in those individuals. We just don't know. Um, so I, I always say I like to have multiple choices as a physician. I don't want to be boxed into having only one choice. Um, and so in this particular study, um, <clears throat> you know, we are telling our participants this is the vaccine we're studying. We don't want you to participate in another study of another vaccine because that will mess up both studies. That would be the wrong thing to do. Um, but if a vaccine becomes available and, and approved by the FDA, then you would certainly be eligible to, to go get that uh, vaccine. And in fact, if this one works, um, we have committed to everybody that received placebo to come back and get the real thing. Dana, I, I, go ahead. I, yeah, I think we should, we should let the public know that there are different companies that make a number of different vaccines. So there's a, there's a couple different companies that make hepatitis B vaccine. There's a couple different types of uh, pneumonia vaccine, which protect you against the bacteria strep pneumoniae. We know that there are several different companies that make influenza vaccine. So this is nothing new. And hopefully, if you do have these uh, multiple choices of vaccines to choose from, they also protect you in different ways. And even Dr. Fauci has stated you may need two or three different vaccines as we move through this process. So I think it's a good thing that we have um, some variety. Lance, if you were talking about our healthcare workers here at KU as an example, who do you think we would want to vaccinate first? How, what, what, mm -hmm. Because I think it'll help the public to understand how we approach it. Clearly, nursing homes, et cetera. But yeah. I think about healthcare workers and, and uh, first responders. How would you prioritize that? Yeah, I think we can look um, kind of how we handle flu uh, vaccine. You know, that is something that, um, you know, over time has been more of a mandate for healthcare workers because um, I like the conversation about um, spreading the virus um, with a with vaccine because, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily get a flu vaccine because they're at risk of dying because of the flu. They get the flu vaccine to protect their um their infant, their grandparents. So it's it's really about the you know collective health of their community as to why they want to get the vaccine and be immune so that they don't have the potential to spread it. And that's what's really critical for healthcare workers is we take care of patients who have little to no immune system, who, you know, the, the flu to a healthcare worker may be a quick, you know, two, three days, but it could mean life or death for our patients. So um, I think it's really important for healthcare workers to um, whenever it's available to be prioritized for that, especially because we are at risk because we've never been able to shelter in place. We've never been able to stay at home. We've had to come and take care of our patients. We are an essential business. So all of our staff have been um, required to come out into the community and um, interact with, with people and uh, you know some people with coronavirus. So I think we can look at that to see that all healthcare workers need to be able to be prioritized for this and get it so that we can um, safely care for our uh, patients. Jill, that's, that's a great point. Thank yeah. you, Lance. And Jill, I bet there are more questions out there. Ashley wants to know if everyone on this panel would get this vaccine. Yeah, Did pick me. I'll panel. do it. How fast would you do it, Dana? I'm, I was going to look it up. Lance has got his hand up. So yeah, that's right. Well, we'll Frontiers.org. And, and, uh, and John, how soon would you be willing to do a vaccine? Uh, two years ago, I would have done it as immediate as it was available. I'm going to guess, Mario, that she'd probably get a vaccine, too. 
Yes, unfortunately, I can as part of the leader of the study. But <laughs> well, I can't, though. <laughs> but, but I think we see stories all the time about people, and they've been on the major media outlets about people who are volunteering and do this and mm -hmm. say that they're doing this as part of their civic duty. So I think there is a large population out there who wants to volunteer and be able to do these things. Okay, so we all know that the, there is a group out there, the never vaxxers, who don't want to mm -hmm. see that happen, and yeah. et cetera. They're just afraid of all the bad health effects. Somehow we're manipulating the human body in a way that it wasn't meant to. But I try to explain to them, and you guys can do a better job than I can. I try to explain to folks, really, it's just like getting the infection. Would you rather have an infection that's not going to kill you or an infection that could kill you? It's really just getting the infection, right? I mean, that's what vaccination does. I, I, it's really not unsafe. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, you know, we're doing the study now, and, and we have to be in full disclosure. We don't know. Um, you know, when we use this in 30,000 individuals, is it going to be different than in 1,000 individuals? But I, I, I think given what we know about this virus, that, that that risk is so much lower than the risk of getting the active infection, like you say, and, and that is just proportionally. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I, I say that to our patients, and I, I say, you know, it, it may not be affecting you, but what if you're the carrier and you affect your loved one? You know, and so this vaccine will help you prevent you from acquiring that infection and spreading the disease. To someone else that you didn't ever know about, Dana, because yeah. so many times people are asymptomatic, so they wouldn't even know they were spreading it. Right. And so if we can have an immune um, function that is already there, already in place, should you become exposed, and you can block the replication or as much replication as you normally would if you were exposed without the vaccine, you can probably decrease the amount that you're spreading it to other people as well. So. Stacy needs some clarification just around COVID. She said, how do we go from the health department sending a letter saying the four core counties are doing badly, Dr. Norman tweeting, Johnson County is doing badly, and two days later, we have bent the curve? Yeah, I'm not so sure it's two days later, but uh, John, you want to start with that? What, so basically, you have things happening, and we're constantly monitoring, but so there, there's a difference between total cases and then the population rate. And on your Friday um, podcast, I noticed you guys were discussing, obviously, you're in Wyandotte County and Johnson County is having problems, and that is absolutely true. But it's not um, it, the opposite isn't true. So there are also Western counties, say like Finney County, where Green Garden City is. They're, they've, over the last three months, they've popped up of being one of the worst counties. Now, that was mostly related to meatpacking plant outbreaks. Um, but just because there's smaller counties, the, the, you know, those that aren't Wichita and Johnson and um, Wyandotte, th there are other counties that have had problems go on and off, and we monitor those. In fact, let me put a plug in. We had volunteers doing contact tracing from University of Kansas Medical Center. We had a lot of medical students over the last few months, but a lot of those people are leaving. And so we transitioned from some volunteers, we had about 30 to 40 of them, to we're bringing on 30 um, permanent employees to do contact tracing. And you mentioned on Friday that, yes, we need to get testing, and we always need to do more testing. But it's that follow-up contact tracing case investigation that's super important. So it's, it, I, I think I said this at the beginning, we always seem to be behind the data curve five to seven days. So it's hard to see where we are if you, unless you cut off like maybe the last week. So you really the, the most reliable data you've got is like Monday a week ago. Yeah, and I think that's the key. The answer to this question really is found, in, I think, in this, that what we do is we report the new positive tests. Those people who are positive have to go and get tested. They're tested because they have symptoms or maybe they're having a surgery case, et cetera. But let's assume that but both of these surgery. are symptomatic because the surgical case is in the pre-op. That's a pretty small percentage. So if you're getting symptoms, that means you probably got six, seven to eight to 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. So the reality is testing is delayed from where you are in the population. So we may say one day, hey, the things are still going up. Man, we're also eternal optimists. We string two or three good days together yeah. in a row, and we're hoping that we bent the curve. The reality is we won't know if we bent that curve for two or three weeks. Lance, other thoughts about that? Because I think that's probably the key to that question. 
Yeah, you know, we're hearing that there are uh, significant delays to testing in the community. And, you know, I've seen the reports of lines around the block for testing uh, facilities. And I think that that kind of illustrates this problem that we have that, um, you know, I, I get it. it. It is, it's confusing. And there are, when you see some kind of delayed reports, I, I understand that that can um, kind of make people think that maybe this is um, invalid. But um, I think that's an important consideration is that, um, you know, we've known that that the testing has been a big conversation, especially in the U.S. Um, this whole time. And I think that's really important to to know that, you know, you could be tested um, for COVID. And, and I've seen, you know, five to seven day waves in the community that I've seen with different infection preventionists around the country. Um, so it, it's a problem that, that we know about. And I think that is it's really critical that people who are tested get their result back quickly. So then obviously there's downstream effects to that when uh, a public health entity has to report that um, and then make sure the community knows what the current numbers are. So I think that's a confounding variable of all of it. And um, I, I think everyone's very aware that the U.S. has had an issue with uh, testing availability and efficiency. Yeah, I think that's that's true. And I do think we get to be optimistic after a couple of three days. I mean, we think yeah. we've flattened the curve I, already I'm because hoping, we've had yeah. three days of being in the low 30s instead of in the high 30s yeah. or up in the 40s where we thought we were going to go. Joyce wants to know if you can explain how the cause of death is determined when the patient has both COVID-19 and other contributing factors. Well, you know, Mario, you have to take this on up in the ICU. And, mm -hmm. and we know that somebody has COVID-19, but then they die. They may not die specifically of COVID-19 right. and maybe the end organ damage they had. Right. right. I think it's a, it's a great question. And certainly, they're intricately related. Yeah. Um, if you have bad heart disease, bad lung disease, and you get this virus, you're more likely uh, to die from this uh, infection than somebody that starts out normal. Um, healthy lungs. And so I, I think what we do as physicians typically is we think, what is the primary cause of death? What led to that demise? And that's what we list. So in most instances in acute setting like this, we would say it's the COVID-19 infection. Um, and then we list those other, this person also had heart disease, this person had lung disease or had underlying cancer. Um, and so that information is captured, but, but what we're reporting in terms of deaths likely if anything, it's underreporting uh, because there's likely cases out there of COVID-19 infection that are not getting tested mm -hmm. and die and are listed as pneumonia without any further description. And so I suspect we're underreporting, if anything. Yeah, and I think what happens when we do an autopsy paper is you, you fill out a lot of stuff and somebody may get COVID, then they get, like you said, heart disease, they have a heart attack, they can go in pneumonia, they can get lung, they can get fibrosis of the lungs, they can't breathe anymore. So the cause of death is lung fibrosis, but the yeah. cause of that was COVID. And so right. that then there are other things that they had underlying disease and COVID made it worse. So COVID can cause problems. That's true really of any viral yes. illnesses, Dana. They all yep. cause different problems and can affect our organs differently. Absolutely. And I think that happens with anything with influenza even. You know, with anything, when somebody dies, as you said, it was a cause of this, because of this, because of this. What was the ultimate etiology of that? And it does go back to COVID in a lot of these cases. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, John, it's hard to figure that, all that out as an epidemiologist. I know the state tries to figure out cause of death a lot, but it, it's kind of intricate because it could say influenza or COVID. But the reality is maybe it ended up your heart failed or your lung failed, and you guys are trying to parse that data out out in Topeka. And, and the good news is our vital stats department, you know, it's not that we do an either or, we do all of the above. And so if you actually go to the CDC website and look at um, COVID-19 death table, they actually break it out by COVID-19 only, COVID-19 with influenza, COVID-19 with pneumonia, because we all know that it kind of progresses to pneumonia and that's what you die from, just like influenza. And so it's not an either or, it's all of the above. And I know it gets complicated and only a data geek like me loves the statistics of it. Um, but it's, it's, it, if you look at the data overall for the entire United States, it is a large, it is still a large majority COVID only um, death related. If I think it's above 87% or something like that, if you look at 
uh, coronavirus, pneumonia, and influenza. So it, it's it's I, I know I get this question a lot, which is how many deaths were we having from influenza a year ago versus coronavirus deaths now, and that excess mortality. Um, statistic is off the charts for those um, 60 and above. So we are definitely seeing an increased amount of mortality um, of this respiratory illness relative to a normal influenza summer. Been a tough year. And by the way, I think you just called yourself and Spock a data geek, but that's okay. <laughs> Jill, last question, I think. Yeah, Stacy is hoping that um, John can maybe confirm or deny that there was a tops dance competition at the Overland Park Convention Center in mid-July. She's hearing that 50 plus people tested positive, but they have not yet been contacted by tracers, contact tracers. John, you know, I don't know anything about that specific of a question. Do you, or can you, and can you talk I, about it? The specifics, I, I, even if I knew, I want to be able to talk about those specifics. I'm not pertinent to those clusters, but I can. So really that's a question of cluster how many clusters there have been. And there is a website at the KDHC, there's a micro coronavirus site that you can actually click on the COVID-19 and then it takes you into a data graph and you can click on clusters and you can kind of, it's not gonna tell you specific who, but it's gonna tell you what kind. And I can tell you that like public sports gatherings like that is a, tiny amount. In fact, I'm looking at it right now, and there's only been seven total clusters with only 55 cases. Um, I think I mentioned this before, that we're always kind of running seven to 10 days behind. But if you're saying that that's from early July, we would have already picked up on it if that was the case. The problem in public health is you'll get a lot of individuals as at an individual level um, saying something, but when the state health department or the county health department went and investigated it, they didn't end up being connected. Um, so I can't say whether it was, but I can tell you that we aren't a month behind in case investigations. So that would be very odd. So Lance, so time for us to wrap up the day. Um, Lance, final thoughts and anything you want to add about case investigation, because I know you do a whole lot of it here at KU. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, kind of my biggest takeaway um, today, especially now is, all of the measures we put in place are more important now than they have ever been. I think I'm worried that the community is going to get a false sense of security because we don't have the accompanying um, governmental restrictions right now. Um, you know, and, and there are some states that are going back to some of those restrictions. So I think I just want to implore people wear your mask, wash your hands, don't wear gloves in public, and um, clean and disinfect high touch surfaces. I think I'm, my main concern right now is a false sense of security. Um, you know, I think people, I love that we're doing this. I hope people um, listen in, tune in, and, and, and hear the numbers because it's really important for you to understand what's happening in your community um, as we go forward. For being part of that, John, final thoughts today? Um, I'm worried about what's coming up here in September and October. Obviously, influenza season will kick up again, but I'm worried with the decreased amount of sunlight. Everybody's getting great sunlight. There's great studies out there that show sunlight exposure and vitamin D, vitamin D relating to better immune systems and, and lesser health outcomes when you get coronavirus. I'm really worried that uh, we're going to get to September, October, and we'll still have huge cases, but our death our death curve will increase. And so that will be something that we at the state health department, we're gonna be looking at very, very specifically. And of course, schools reopening, that's a huge topic of conversation you guys had on Friday. We're discussing that all the time. We were part of the school board decisions. Um, obviously it's a, it's a school board by school board at the local level decision, but we're gonna help as much as we can. We're gonna prioritize teachers whenever vaccine becomes available. Um, so we're, 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 we're on it. All right. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, I'd thought? like to echo what Lance said. Um, you know, I work with Lance on a daily basis. He's great. Nobody wants to have another, um, quarantine or mandatory stay at home orders. We now all know that masks work. If both parties are wearing them, we can continue to physically and socially distance and wear masks. And hopefully we can bend this curve. 
and keep the spread of COVID uh, to a low, lowest amount as possible so we don't have to go back home to those stay-at-home orders. All right, so coming up tomorrow, Dr. Carrie Weinicke from the chair of OBGYN and Dr. Whitney Pressler, who's the medical director of our newborn nursery, will be helping to answer, us, uh, answer for us questions we have around COVID-19 and pregnancy, newborns, and, uh, and things around women's health especially. So we'll really look forward to that. Dr. Castro, actually, should I say Captain Castro, captain of the USS Jayhawk, taking us to the future with the vaccination. Yeah. We've got to make sure we keep following the, the, the pillars of infection prevention and control because you've got to get to that vaccination. We've got a few more months to wait. I know you're at warp speed. Final thoughts. Yeah, I just want to reiterate, uh, and hopefully the banner could be uh, put up there in terms of uh, signing up for the registry is coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org and uh, identify that you're KUMC so we know uh, how to contact you and uh, where to reach out to you. Or you can call us at 913-574-3006 there in the Kansas City region and 316-293-1833 in Wichita. Help us, help us fight this pandemic. I mean, uh, if you've never participated in study, there's no, no better reward to know that you've helped us uh, try to solve this, uh, this issue. And, and ultimately, for those that are hesitant out there, I just want to reassure, we're going to do this right. We're going to do this clinical trial the way it should be done, and we're going to let you know whether or not this is going to work. And it's going to be very important because not everybody can participate in study, but we need to find out the information. We need to find it out warp speed. Warp speed. I love it. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Sure. And you guys are all going to have to come back because we have so many questions. I could tell from Jill's face that we didn't get anywhere near all the questions. And I suspect we could spend an entire hour at least or several just on the question of vaccination alone. And as that trial gets heated up, um, we're going to have you back so we can talk more about it. When's your start date? August 10th, All in right. two weeks. So coming up. So we'll get you back right at the start of that so we get you get, get everybody right. to know about it. And hopefully if people can go out there and Google coronavirus vaccine KU, you can probably find their way to yep. you, I'm going to guess. So yep. so thanks, everybody, for uh, being a part of our program today. Um, it's been, a, it's been a, great, a great time. We had great guests and look forward to talking with you all soon again. Some mask pictures to, to take us off the air today. And uh, remember tomorrow, women's health issues. So thank you so much for being part of it. And remember, until tomorrow. There's still no place like home. We'll see you then.